So other than Gustav working on tarpon, uh, does anyone know about this species before today? Just a raise of hands. Wow, that is shocking. Has anyone actually fished for tarpon before? Except Rob, one, and have you hooked one before and landed it? Ah, that's very rare. Yes, okay. These are very difficult uh, fish to catch. Um, they're, they're quite remarkable when you hook them. Uh, they'll do these acrobatic jumps, uh, and they have very bony mouths. You can see that fly trying to hang on for its life. And so you hook a lot of these fish, but you don't land them. And southeast uh, the U.S., where I work, uh, this is an extremely important species, not only economically, so it contributes to multiple hundreds of millions of dollars to the economy, but also culturally. Uh, it's uh, even have a city, Tarpon Springs, named after Tarpon in Florida. Uh, you go to a restaurant, there'll probably be a big picture of a tarpon in Florida. Uh, mailboxes are the shape of tarpon. And uh, when one of these tarpon die, because it's not a harvest fishery, uh, a lot of times fishing guides will, or anglers will get so emotional, they'll start tearing up. It's a very important species, uh, regardless how you feel about catch and release. And one of the great aspects about this fishery in this incredible migratory animal is they have so many different habitats they can occur on. So in the left side here we have a temperate area, so characteristic of nutrient-rich waters, dark, lots of prey biomass. And then on the right you have the Florida Keys, the very tip of Florida. You can actually sight fish for these fish along with bonefish and permit. Um, so two very different habitats, uh, quite a bit of large range, and it makes management and conservation of the species pretty difficult. Uh, so just speaking to that range here, uh, in the purple, uh, oh, here this one, uh, they have an extensive range, but really this is their core that we're going to be talking about today, the Gulf of Mexico uh, and a lot in the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, but there is no commercial fishery for these fish. And so in the U.S., that means there's no stock assessment. We have no idea what their population status is other than the local ecological knowledge and a few catch records that we have over the decades. And the trend appears to be declining. And because we don't have these stock assessments, we can't really form these management plans for these migratory fish. And so while harvest uh, doesn't happen for consumption, uh, harvest typically happened in the U.S. at least as a trophy fishery. They would catch these fish, they'd bring them to the dock, they'd weigh them, it happens occasionally now, and then just roll them off the side. There is a subsistence fishery, of course, in Latin America, um, but harvest is not a huge issue in the U.S. But poor catch and release practices are. So you keep a fish out of the water too long, uh, if the water is above 30 degrees Celsius, that fish is going to have a hard time, especially considering the migratory energetic ex expenses they have to up migrate up and down the coast. Shark predation is also related to catch and release. And then we have widespread habitat loss and declining water quality, especially in this area of Florida, which is the world capital for tarpon fishing. Um, but it really extends from a little bit in Texas, but Louisiana, all the way up through the Carolinas. And then more recently, we're becoming more concerned about prey declines. Uh, I'll get into that later in the talk. But the first step to looking at this uh, uh, improvement of management and conservation is we really need to understand how these species interacts with each of these threats throughout their migratory patterns each year. We know very little about their biology and ecology. So let me give a detailed refresher about acoustic telemetry. No, just kidding. Uh, you know how it works. Uh, we tag these fish. We have these receivers, picks up that fish. But what's beautiful about this technology is we can tag fish as small as you know, 5 kg all the way up to 90 kg. And we tag these fish with these five-year battery lives, so we have these repeatable migratory patterns. Whereas we used to use satellite, or colleagues have used satellite telemetry. Um, these are external packages that are quite expensive, and the retention time on them for these fish are three to four months, so that's not even one migratory cycle. Um, and so we track these with acoustic telemetry. Typically, it's uh, fine scale re resolution networks. But here we are leveraging the collaborative support of these uh, acoustic tel telemetry arrays that other people are using to study sea turtles, bull sharks, sturgeon. And as tarpon get detected on one of these 
collaborators receiver networks. Uh, they share that detection and vice versa. And it's largely supported and facilitated through Rob's program, the Ocean Tracking Network. So to tag these fish is very difficult. Uh, maybe we should have hired you who landed one. Uh, it's uh, ch quite a challenge. Uh, so this is a well-known fishing guide, Scott Collins. Prior to this photo, he was on this polling platform with this long pole silently creeping around these shallow water flats. And then here, they hook one tarpon, he gets down, he's about to land it, and he gives me a call, and we, we pull up next to the fishing guide to get that fish and tag it. Now, we really rely on the fishing guides, not just based on catching these fish, but also the location where we put these receivers, what are the major conservation questions they have that they've noticed in their environment, and how can we leverage this data to support? So we pull up, uh, me and my colleague, we, we slide this fish into the sling. We do a quick internal surgery, and that's okay when you have a young adult, uh, but of course, we have a large range of fish that can get quite large. So again, we're tagging small fish, seeing those ontogenetic shifts, and those large, larger females. This fish could easily be 50, 60 years old. They're late maturing, um, and, and uh, they mature at 12 years old, and they're long-lived. So you remove one, it takes a long time to replace. So yellow detections that we have, we're limited by where the receivers are placed, uh, but we wanted to understand the connectivity. Is there any subgroup division based on their movements? Primarily, say, the eastern Gulf of Mexico and that eastern side, uh, the Atlantic seaboard. So we tagged fish across their range in these red boxes to answer those questions on migratory connectivity. And quickly here, you can see all of these, uh, this date here, this summer, this is their northern foraging areas. Um, so we have detections uh, colored by the year they were in, 2016 through 2021. Uh, and each dot is a different tarpon. So you can see they're coming back south to overwinter. Uh, this is around December. There's quite a bit of movement still. And then soon you'll see in the springtime, this is their spawning period. So if you're not already down here in the Florida Keys, a lot of them move down south. And then they're going to have an explosive, explosive northward movements to those darker waters that hold um, rich biomass. And of course, no fish is going through the middle of the state. This is acoustic telemetry. These are just interpolations in between these detections. No fish went to Disney World. So taking this a step further here, we have month on the x-axis and latitude on the y. Think of 24, that nutrient-deprived uh, uh, areas, those tropics, and then the really nutrient-rich areas. And so we have these fish. You can see there's a huge range of diversity of some fish going quite far, some fish stopping at locations and spending the time there. So while there's a lot of diversity in the, uh, the fish that we tagged, on an individual level, they're highly repeatable in these movements. They're going the same locations, almost like bluefin tuna, to forage each year and around the similar times. So we took this a step further, and we modeled uh, mechanistically these, uh, these migrations based on net square displacement. So how far did that fish go, and when did it return? And from those models, we can derive a handful of parameters. Here I'm highlighting the migratory uh, timing of their spring migration, those 95% uh, confidence intervals, and then we can identify that it really occurs, you know, June to early July, and then it's a bit slower in the fall as they come down south, and that's between September and November. So just a quick overview uh, here. In the fall, they're moving south. The main driver is temperature. Again, we have water quality um, issues. Uh, in the winter, some fish are continuing to move south. Some are remaining in these overwintering locations that we were able to identify through this project. Uh, again, water quality is issues. And in the spring, they're moving down south uh, for spawning. Um, and here we have a different set of issues, not just pollution, water quality, but we also have issues with uh, something related to Rob's talk. Uh, we have issues with sharks taking the fish off the fishing line, and then after you release it, I'll get into that in a moment. And in the summer, they're jetting up north oops, uh, for those rich biomass, which is are currently we're concerned about being over-harvested, not just for tarpon, but other uh, game fish and commercially important fish. So getting back to that question about connectivity, that's why we had such a huge financial investment tagging fish across uh, both areas. Uh, we want to understand, is there any difference between east and west side of fish uh, between 
this area and this area. And so I won't get in too much detail, but this is called network analysis. Uh, I want you to realize that each dot is a tarpon, and each location that gets detected on has a gray line going to that. And you essentially you cluster these detections, and then you just decide if there's any patterns through some algorithms. And so all these locations are all located on this side, on the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And all these fish were detected really along the eastern side of the um, northeast, or southeast. And so we had a pretty clear distinction that these fish were these uh, going to this side year after year, and for the most part, these fish were going to this side year after year. And we had most of the mixing occurring here in that Florida Keys, um, and a really important uh, location for fishing. This happens in the spring. That's that clear water where they're sight fishing. So this is where that overlap happens. So we have that mixing area for spawning purposes. How do we uh, take this to conservation and management? Well, in the U.S., for tarpon, we manage this fish at the state level. And so take, for example, Louisiana. Uh, they don't have any regulations on harvest. This happens uh, with kill tournaments I was talking about. You catch the biggest fish, weigh it, you throw it over. You can still take as many fish as you want for tarpon at any size. In different states, we have, uh, depending on the size and number of fish you can keep. Um, and, and for these ones, Florida, which is great, this is the location for most of the fishery. And even in Virginia, their more northern area that hasn't had a very developed fishery, these are actually catch and release. And this is critical because these fish are moving all the way up here. So the same fish that they're fishing for Louisiana are the same fish you're fishing here in the Keys. So there's a mismatch between the ecology of this fish and the management. So leveraging the data, uh, we're still in the process, working with folks as grassroots organizations. Uh, one state just recently adopted this catch and release amendment, which is quite exciting. But because we have so much uh, catch and release dominated fishery, uh, we're really concerned about how people handle fish. This is an energetically expensive migration year after year. And so now in Florida, it's the only state that has a rule that fish at a certain size has to remain in the water. Again, it, it can vary widely. Some fishing guides will tear up, like I said, when a fish starts to look like it might die, and others are bringing it up on the side of the boat, taking photos for a few minutes, and then dumping it over. So the huge ride range. But again, it's the same fish across these state areas. And I should mention that we saw those two groups here and here, but we never saw any fish cross this border. There's some dividing border, which I think is related to entrainment and social learning, collective uh, migratory behaviors. So let's focus into Florida Keys, uh, wonderful location. Uh, we have these receivers in white, and then the thicker the green lines, those are our migratory corridors for these tarpon. Drilling down a bit further, uh, we want to understand when these fish exactly arrive, how long they stay, and then when do they depart. So here, this is one example. This is uh, through machine learning algorithms, which are pretty highly predicted algorithms. You can test it on holdout data sets. And one of the big uh, uh, great assets of machine learning in acoustic telemetry is you can have a lot of different variables. And you don't have to uh, deal with multicollinearity as much and also uh, nonlinearity. So here you can see the temperature is quite fluctuating. Um, and so just this lower left panel month here, sea surface temperature, you can see in the darker areas, this is really when the tarpon arrive annually in the Florida Keys. So around 27 degrees Celsius around the month of April and May, which is something we've already known through the fishing guides, but we can support with this. Interestingly, fish that would arrive, say, some fish would overwinter here. So say the first week of December, some fish would come down here uh, and overwinter. Those fish will show up the next year within seven to 14 days of that last year. So it's not necessarily a, a temperature factor driving at the individual level, certainly the population, but we think it's more related to photo period and these migratory cues for these fish to migrate. So catch and release education will be critical here because we know this is a really important substantial mixing area. We have boat traffic issues with jet skis driving over these fish. These are shallow water fish. People drive right over them. And then water quality has huge issues um, from the Everglades as well. Speaking of water quality, uh, we'll go to the, the west side of Florida, also a very important location for the fishery, and also fish move offshore to spawn and then come back in and go up north to migrate. 
for foraging areas. But we have red tide events, Carina brevis, that's naturally occurring in algae. But in recent years, it's been increasing in uh, not only frequency, but also intensity. So you can clearly see where the algal bloom is here. And it, of course, is a neurotoxin and leads to mortality events. Not just for tarpon, other important commercial and recreational species, megafauna, and human health. This is a huge issue with uh, nutrient discharge in, in Florida. So we took a three-prong approach here, not just telemetry. We interviewed expert fishing guides that have been in the fishery for 20, 30, 40, some 50 years. Uh, we asked uh, what, what was their observations. We looked at the movements of tarpon during, after, and before uh, algal blooms. And then we also looked at catch records of tarpon uh, during algal blooms and non-algal blooms. The fishing guides were unanimous and said blooms are increasing, uh, and not just increasing, but really overlapping with the tarpon season. Uh, and, and interestingly, this, these tarpon movements, we didn't see any difference, and this coincides with the local ecological knowledge because the fishing guides will actually comment that these tarpon will feed along the edges of the algal blooms, feeding on the fish that are ha struggling a bit more. Um, and, and so, yes, there are some fish kills. It's not massive but we have bigger issues about reproductive concerns. We know this red tide event will reduce the success, success of reproduction for other fish, and not just for the spawning fish, but the larvae that come back in. Massive concerns. And then the fishery impacts. We saw during algal blooms, you're predicted to catch uh, less fish than when it was not elevated. And this is again a $100 million fishery for this area. Um, and it's really providing evidence to reduce nutrient discharge and improve monitoring efforts. Talking about tarpon and sharks, uh, this is uh, one of the bigger concerns. We have uh, these massive pre-spawning aggregations, whether that be in that last location or in the Florida Keys, you know, say 10,000 fish, and then they move offshore to spawn. But because the tarpon love it, anglers love it, and because you can have an easy meal. The sharks love it, hammerheads and bull sharks. So this fish was yet to even go off spawning for that year. So you're losing a 40, 50, 60 year old fish before it gets to spawn that year. So we wanted to track not just tarpon, which is the yellow, but also hammerheads in blue and then bull sharks. Whether we tag the hammerheads herself or collaborators with hammerhead tags out there are bull sharks. And those receivers still here along the Florida Keys uh, but we aggregated these, we clustered them, and we looked at, okay, here's the number of detections from tarpon and the yellow, the blue was hammerheads, where are those overlapped? And that's that gray area. Similarly, we have red as uh, bull sharks, and the kind of the overlap is in the orange color. And we noticed a huge area of overlap in this one location I'm gonna dive into, it's called Bahia Honda. This is a uh, major pre-spawning location, and also a popular angling place. And we don't only just look at the overlap, but we looked at the timing of the sharks when and when the tarpon were not at these locations. And we found that the tarpon were in some places and the sharks were non-randomly showing up, almost as if they were pursuing these opportunities. So yes, tarpon are presence driving shark movements, and when that was done through machine learning again, and then sharks are targeting popular tarpon angling locations. And so Bay Honda, this is a really great spot to catch a tarpon if you want. Uh, also to see a giant hammerhead. Uh, so we have two bridges here. Uh, it's, it's, this is the active bridge and this is our old railroad bridge. And we have acoustic receivers here to do a bit more of a finer resolution of the tracking data. And then this is a, uh, all the boats will line up in these uh, spans, this bridge spans. They drop crabs, you know, three, four meters down and they just keep drifting them to the massive numbers of fish uh, that are there. And eventually you'll get a bite or two depending if you have a good drift or not. And so again, here's a good guide friend, um, Kevin Grubbs, uh, and he is having a depredation event. So a big hammerhead comes up and eats that tarpon off the fishing line. And you know, obviously anglers kind of enjoy it, but I'll tell you these fishing guides do not. Not necessarily him, but you'll notice that a lot of these hammerheads will have prop scars all over their faces and their fence. And in Florida, they're protected, but you still have people reversing into them trying to do serious damage to these sharks because this is their livelihoods and they care a lot more about these fish than the hammerheads. And I should mention this is part of Dr. Grace Castleberry's uh, PhD uh, work that she just defended in our lab, or Andy's lab. 
Um, and what one uh, uh, estimates ways to estimate how much mortality was occurring is she sat on that old railroad bridge for an entire summer in the heat with a pair of binoculars and camera, and she would count every single time someone would hook up with a tarpon, how long they fought it, and if a shark came up. And you can see the predation events pretty clearly. So she found 13 minutes of land, but nine and a half minutes for a depredation. The sharks are quite fast to get onto them. And not only do we have to worry about depredation, but post-release mortality after release that fish. Those fish are tracking it, you know, almost 10 minutes later, these big migratory fish and killing them. Uh, so overall, we estimate around a 15% mortality rate if you have an extended fight um, with tarpon. So, so uh, <laughs> whether that's a major issue for the population and it's precautionary, I would say yes, uh, it could be a concern. And she looked at what other factors would um, influence uh, survival. So survival probability, zero to one. So one, you'd be surviving, zero, you'd be dead, across minutes, upwards of 50 minutes. So when the current was actually going in one direction, the end current, uh, we actually have a fairly high survival rate. Um, but when the outgoing current occurs, uh, it drops off pretty dramatically around 30 minutes. So again, we, we didn't just tag tarpon, but we tagged hammerheads. It's a relatively small one. They get up to you know, three, four meters. Uh, and we put these cattle ear tags on for the guys to identify the, the, which individuals were recurring um, culprits. Uh, surprisingly, we didn't really see that many uh, of the same individuals. It was quite a big number of hammerheads in this area that were cycling in and out. Further, they were mostly large females. Using ultrasound, you could see pups in them. So it was a reproductively uh, important area for these fish for, for um, accruing calories. And here's our external tag to make it a quick trip, our tagging of it. So in this area, mean residence time in minutes, and then we have month on the uh, x-axis. And so you can see tarpon across the months, they're generally similar, but with uh, hammerheads, you see this dramatic peak between March, April, May, and June, and then it falls off. And that corresponds to that other pri previous work talking about the Florida Keys and when they're coming in. And then if we look at uh, hour of day, zero to 20, so night, day, night. Uh, for tarpon, they're pretty flat. And then for hammerheads, they increase during the day when the fishing activity is greatest, and they decrease at night when fishing activity diminishes. Talking about the tracking data, we uh, subsetted the core use areas. So yellow would be tarpon, uh, red's hammerhead here. So on the incoming, that area with high survivor rate, more or higher, I should say, uh, there is overlap, yeah. There is overlap. It's not as positioned downstream of the current. But on the outgoing, when it's a huge issue, you can see these hammerheads are kind of hanging out right behind the bridge. That's when the fishing is most active. Once you hook up with the fish, you drift down with the current, and this is where the hammerheads are waiting to pounce. Again, this is the spawning, uh, so April would be a spawning month, November is a non-spawning month, and again, you can see that overlap between hammerheads and tarpon during the spawning period when angling is much more active. So again, this goes back to catch and release education, uh, reduce fight times, so we can you know, have heavier tackle, heavier rods, thicker lines. Uh, some people break off tarpon much more common. Um, they don't really like to land the fish, grab the fish. And then, of course, there's a lot more opportunities for potential shark deterrent approaches in this fishery. So we also put out a, a region-wide survey. Uh, around 1,500 people responded, which was really wonderful. Um, and we asked the question, how is the tarpon fishery doing? Has it declined or has it remained stable? And so the more red it is, it means it declined or dramatically declined. And this is really characterized by those that have been in the angling uh, community for decades. So that whole fishing ba uh, shifting baseline syndrome might be occurring here. But those more older generational anglers are really identifying that that fishery has declined. We also asked about the angler and guide top priorities. So catch and release regulations, I mentioned that quite a bit. Strict handling guidelines increase in tarpon research, which is what I love to see. And then water and habitat quality advocacy. And really not only did we shape our research project based on these anglers and guides qu initial questions, but this is how we're gonna leverage uh, um, the data to support their priorities in these important conservation areas. 
The next conservation opportunity as well is reduction in prey items. So we have menahaden used for fertilizer, omega-3, uh, cosmetics, and in these more northern areas where those tarpon are migrating for three, four months of the year. This is w probably one of the main reasons why they're up here. And you can see there's been a dramatic crash of this fishery. Essentially, in the U.S., this is an unregulated fishery. Um, the, the commercial fishery sets their own quotas, practically. And so we're actually going to apply stable isotope analysis. So we take a small fin clip, and then we understand the diets a bit better. And pairing it with the acoustic telemetry, we're going to create a resource landscape. And we can better understand, OK, in these areas, are they really dependent on the estuaries, the freshwater uh, areas that are providing the biomass there? Or is it more pelagic? And again, it's creating that evidence for furthering management for these fish. Extensively work with fishing guides, of course. Uh, this is no small feat. So they take that fin clip, put it in a small vial, and they mail it. We're around up to 1,000 as of last week. So. Because I've talked so much about how we engage with the angling community, I do want to show a video of how we convey these results and garner support. So it's a bit comical, uh, but this has been a really useful collaboration with Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, the main funder of this work. Here it comes. He's on it. Got him. Ooh-wee. No more beautiful sight than two great warriors doing battle on the flats. There's Ted from Cleveland. Ted, 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 Ted. And the other? <laughs> well, turns out he's been more places than Genghis Khan. This particular Silver King started his life off the coast of Louisiana. It was a classic tarpon love story. A pretty lady from Louisiana takes a shine to a fella from Mexico. It's a full moon, and bingo, bango, bongo. Paint the nursery. It's Larvae City. It was a fairy tale from the start. You'll see, Sally. I'm gonna be a king one day. Just kidding. It was a million to one. But our future king was that one. And as fate would have it, the currents carried him to southwest Florida. Here he enjoyed a sheltered youth, thanks in part to some guardian anglers. Ah! Oh, I can't believe we can't build homes here. I can't stand tarpon. But this was no place for a growing boy to sow his oats. And so he set out for the Carolinas. On his way north, he hooked up with a local legend. Now, mind you, once upon a time, mm -hmm. Captain Millie Sue here would have hung him by his gills off a pier. But these days, she partners with the scientists of BTT. Together, they acoustically tag and track young tarpon. And so, after spending some quality time at the buffet tables off Hatteras, he took his fat and happy self south for the winter, where thanks to catch and release regulations, championed by BTT, he could fulfill his destiny. Dun, dun, dun. I am the butcher of a king! Of facing down your purple people eater. He's on it, got him. And that's in large part possible due to conservation efforts. You are the man. Led by <laughs> BTT. Bonefish and Tarpon Trust bringing science to the fight. It takes anglers, scientists, and guides to do this vital work. Join us today at btt.org slash join. So you can see really the stewards of this fishery are those that practice uh, catch and release with this um, tarpon. Of course, uh, this is no small feat for this pr uh, work. It's a six or seven year project with my supervisor, Andy Downchuck, and many great collaborators. We work extensively with so many fishing guides across the region, Bonefish Tarpon Trust, uh, the big collaborative networks to uh, track these migratory fish, uh, and then ocean tracking network too. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you.
Amazing, just amazing. Uh, really cool stuff. The video was just like the best thing I've ever seen, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> questions? Yeah. Thank you, great presentation. Question, how much do we know about their migration you know, in the rest of the Gulf or to other Caribbean islands? So, in the western side of the Gulf, uh, some telemetry studies have just launched, not the same scale, uh, but it looks like the fish, so there's a meeting place in Louisiana, and then those fish, instead of going th that side, they'll go down towards Mexico off the Yucatan, and then they'll come back up, similar migratory style as the ones on the east side. But the challenging aspect is those fish had a big collapse in the 60s. And only recently, fish have started to show up in that Texas, Louisiana area. And again, it, it's, it kind of feeds into the work of the bluefin tuna as well. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the over to Africa, have you, um, do you know um, anything about that? Who's speaking? Migration to <laughs> Africa. Oh. <Yeah. laughs> um, so there has been some genetic work, uh, and it looks like there's similar species. The, so there is some adults probably that are coming across, whether that's every 100 years or not, but the satellite telemetry data doesn't highlight any sort of widespread migratory behaviors. Uh, they also had the leptocephalus larvo cycle, which is 30 days for these fish, and they're quite uh, adequate at swimming. But again, everything we've seen is the spawning locations, uh, at least off the Florida Keys, they'll spawn, and that Gulf Stream will disperse those larvae as well, upwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More questions? I actually see in these uh, fish books that actually model the distribution all along the French Atlantic coast, which is pretty wild. Yes, yeah. So occasionally... So maybe they can start migrating northwards with the climate change and then we have them at the west coast in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> well, where we're based out of is Massachusetts, which is the northeast of, you know, Boston. And recently this summer, uh, a young graduate or young undergraduate student caught a tarpon off the beach and it made national news. And so it's starting to happen, I think, so... Put in your funding now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Lucas. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Fish Race. <laughs>